It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 259 at block height 673,603 on Sunday, March 7th. What is cracking, Fud? Well, that was a lot of numbers. A lot of numbers going on out there. I amaze myself every day that I don't just turn that into word salad in the middle of a sentence. Like, it, it's, I feel like I've accomplished something every time I get through that. I hear you. I got a pot and a half of coffee in me, and uh, I'm somewhere where I don't think I could reliably do that. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, I thought we'd start this uh, this day off a little, a little different. A little, a little piece of advice for uh, for all the listeners out there for a better internet experience. Oh yeah, I love educational sections. Well. I'm bringing you guys a, a groundbreaking piece from Business Insider that every one of you has to hear. Now, what you guys is, might not have heard of this. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's really obscure stuff. But Are you young cats? <laughs> what is an Ethernet cable? I don't Here's know, how to Shinobi. connect to the internet without Wi-Fi and get a speedier connection. That's an actual headline. Actual headline on Business Insider. I thought that's why they made the routers with six antennas on them. <laughs> this is a real inside scoop, so I'm happy that Business Insider is out there educating the public on this. So kids at home. There is this old fogey thing called Ethernet, and you know what? The Internet is brought to you by it. It's, it's a great invention. There are many, cate many categories of Ethernet cable, just to be aware. Now, if you're running Ethernet cable all over the place next to power this and that and through walls and through a bird's nest and, you know, past your local squirrel, you know, whatever, you might want to consider Category 7, which is shielded. Some days you're gonna like that choice, but what you should know is it's just like Wi-Fi, but in a wire. Papa Fud, Papa Fud, does this mean if I get an unshielded cable, I can make a bigger Wi-Fi antenna? I'm sure you could figure it out, Junior. Anyway, boys and girls, whether you're slaying on Fortnite or you're just downloading the YouTubes, look into those wires you will be impressed with the reliability and uh you can color code them uh to your own taste so this is how they did it back in the stone age yeah right after about 20 networking formats fought it all out and ethernet won oh man this is just one of those things where i look at that and i laugh and then i think Jesus Christ, there's people out there that might actually need that explained. I'm old now. Yep. I've gone full boomer. Ah, yeah. But, yeah. I guess to dive into things for the day, though, um, this first thing is uh, wildly above my head. So... Would would you like to take a, a stab at least, Fud, at, at breaking down um, the paper recently published by the creator of Schnorr Signatures claiming a f major increase in the speed of um, number factorization? <laughs> yeah. So I don't have this paper right in front of me. I think somebody nuked my leg. And um, 
What I have figured out via diving down a couple of Wikipedia pages and, you know, reading enough of this paper to realize that it take me a couple hours to pick up all the notations and whatnot herein is uh, that I was going for a name, but I can't even look at a name. So what got suggested in this paper is that there are techniques to speed up the factorization process of two numbers multiplied together. So you've probably been familiar with at one point in your life the concept of a least common denominator. Uh, so if you've got a number, you can pull that least common denominator out of there and break it into its factors. So for some types of crypto systems, RSA in particular, their security is based on two secret numbers multiplied together that they can then provide as part of their their public key to whomever in the world they want to be able to have talk to them there are other crypto systems that use what are called discrete logarithms where instead of multiplying two numbers together you use a base for one secret number and then do the logarithm I'm sorry, that's your log base of your other secret, secret number. So log A of B. And the magic about logarithms is the solution to that, the X that that equals, is A to the B. No, it's B to the X in the base A. There we go. I think that's correct. Somebody yell at me on Twitter. So in this system, uh, I'll go back since I'm horrible here. These two primes multiplied together because you're supplying that as part of your public key uh, when attacks or I should say methods to speed up factorizing that very large number come about. That just means it's that much easier for somebody to attack that public key data that you put out. Um, so yeah, this is super interesting. Now, the good thing is, I think RSA is considered completely deprecated at this point. Um, people have slowly gotten better at doing things like factorization and you shouldn't be using it, but somebody surely still is. Yeah, and so pretty much like my high level grasp of this is like, yeah, like this breaks a whole category of crypto systems potentially if this actually pans out and is verified through peer review but it does not break things like bitcoin or ecdsa because of the different types of uh mathematical assumptions that it relies on like that you like correct pretty much yeah, that's correct. The The problem here, again, is that you're giving out public data that's attackable via this in some of those older crypto systems. In the newer ones, uh, you're doing uh, logarithmic uh, exponents uh, type math to figure out uh, your secret. And that is not under attack here. It's basic multiplication and factoring that that's under attack. Yeah, and you know the the way uh, somebody put this to me was it's like this is kind of why with in Bitcoin's case if you have a two hundred and fifty six bit key you actually have two hundred and fifty six bits of security, but in the case of systems like RSA like you have to have like a two thousand forty eight like four thousand something bit key to actually get that that two fifty six bit cryptographic protection. Yep. And I think there's uh, some advantages in terms of how you would have to break that up on hardware to even factor it because registers uh, I, are not that many bits wide. But if you get your tricks from Mr. Schnorr, then uh, you might have ways to speed that up. Mm -hmm. So pretty much a very interesting paper that kind of smashes crypto, but... Thankfully, Bitcoin is still safe, people. You still have to wait for the quantum computer. Someday, quantum Satoshi will return. Alrighty. So, so, I hear we have things to activate. Yeah. So, this, um, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say that the whole taproot activation argument is stupid. 
I have traveled back in time to 2009 and I turned Taproot on back then. As far as I'm concerned, I'm done. I turned Taproot on. Everybody else needs to catch up with me. But uh, Russell O'Connor uh, from Blockstream has proposed kind of a, a middle ground, like let's just fucking do something quick and, and easy and safe. And if this doesn't work, we'll figure it out later. But effectively, what he's proposing is he's calling the speedy trial um, activation proposal. And the idea is simply do a three-month signaling period where miners can signal to activate Taproot. Um, miners signaling is the only thing that could trigger Taproot activation. And you only have three months where signaling can trigger that activation. And the idea here is very quick, um, not too much time wasted in the grand scheme of things. But if within three months, miners signal past the threshold and trigger that, then six months after the start of this. So you have this three month signaling period and then another three months with no signaling. If miners trigger activation in that first three months, then Taproot will activate at the end of that second three months. So it would effectively be a six month activation period. But if miners fail to activate this, <clears throat> we'll see that within three months. And so three months after this, halfway through, if they have not triggered activation, then okay, this didn't work. Um, it'll fail. None of these clients will activate. And we wind up back in the same position we're in now, just arguing about how to turn this on. So this, this seems to be kind of gaining a bit of support here, but people are starting to bring up the issue of what if people make a user activated soft fork client during this speedy trial period that conflicts with the activation logic of the speedy trial clients. And yeah. so, yeah. Nothing like a bit corner to make trouble out of something. Everybody wants to activate. Well, we got to have something to argue over, but yeah, um, you know, this is a quick, you know, dirty way to get it done. Um, the period after which we see it's not working would be pretty short. So it's not like you're adding another year to, oh, when do we try again? But yeah, I still think this is getting stupid. And um, yeah, it really seems to me like the only major objection against this is just the potential for a UASF going on at the same time that isn't really compatible with this. But um, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, um, I think it would be reasonable for people supporting a UASF here to kind of cool it for a bit and see if this can gain enough momentum to actually be released in a client. But, um, you know, like I said, I already turned it on. I'm done. I'm checked out of this. I have gone full retard. Anyone is free to join me. But um, <laughs> as far as anything besides that, um, you know, th this is getting so stupid at this point. Let, 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 let's see if this can get consensus. I am honored to be sitting next to a Bitcoin time traveler you know, via the internet. And uh, I hope we can resolve this in three months. I like that timeline more than some other timelines that I've heard. Well, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at. It's like, I, I don't care. Turn it on. Like, let's turn it on. Let's go to the next thing. This is so stupid. Like, if this does not resolve itself soon, I'm of the opinion Bitcoin has ossified. No more changing. Yeah can't have that we're not done we haven't enabled the lightning folks yet oh i'm 100 percent there dude um but you know if we cannot even agree on how to turn on a thing everybody agrees should be turned on then we're at the point of ossification because if this is the kind of shit show going on right now as a tiny little group in the corner 
Imagine the other side of this market fucking 10 X up from here with all the other new players. And it's just like, we're, we're never going to get anything fucking changed then. Like if, if we can't do this now, Bitcoin is ossified. Yeah. I don't know if this is some aspect of woke culture and making sure everybody's aware of everything or what this is, but everybody agrees. So let's just agree. Mm -hmm. All right. Speaking of things that are quite agreeable, uh, I saw that Square is opening up a bank in Utah. They're going to call it Square Financial Services, and it's uh, completing its charter with the FDIC and the Utah Department of Financial Institutions. So they're calling this an industrial bank, I believe, and uh, I've sure heard some chatter about what they might do with this puppy. Yeah, th this just seems to me like they're just taking the, the license and shit and just actually being their own bank just on the back end or to facilitate like loan financing, which is something Square is pretty big at. Um, but like, yeah, I can absolutely see why a company like that, even if it's not to the point of people directly interacting with that bank itself. Um, it's very nice that Square's backend bank is also Square itself. If you are pretty much being the middleman between users and the bank where the money's actually sitting. Yeah, this will put them in the uh, big boy seat with access to everything they would need in the banking system, I suppose. Uh, what I haven't figured out yet is why Utah I think that's a good question. I'd love to know why they chose Utah. Honestly, um, not really familiar with any distinctive legal characteristics out there around banks, but I I would wager an ignorant guess that with the Mormons out there, something something's got to be looking uh, favorable. Well, Utah is a place with uh, precious metal legal tender laws. Interestingly. Um, but a lot of banks like this are set up in South Dakota around credit card laws. It's notably not Wyoming, which now has, uh, interesting crypto custody laws. So, uh, if anybody knows why Utah, let us know. Ding, ding, ding. All right. Speaking of the watchtower. All along the watchtower. So, yeah. Um, this is another interesting uh, proposal from Lightning that just popped out of nowhere. Um, Arash uh, Mirzai, I mean, I, I suck so bad at pronouncing any non-Western names. Uh, Amin Zixad, um, Zhang Zhan Yu, and Ron Stenfield have proposed something called a fair and privacy-preserving watchtower. Um, and this is effectively, at a, at a real high level, this is a really interesting thing because <clears throat> what this is doing is pairing the payment channel between two actual users to a payment channel that involves both users and the same watchtower. So anybody who's been kind of keeping up with watchtower design space and everything <clears throat> should be going, wait, what two users using the same watchtower is the watchtower in the position to selectively screw anyone they want then? Um, and that's why the entire design here pretty much settles around atomically linking the states of both those channels. So excuse me one second for a water sip. I need to prepare myself for a long rant. So hopefully everybody remembers the concept of a generalized lightning channel, um, which we covered back sometime late last year. Um, a quick refresher is effectively <clears throat> in the current design, the commitment transaction that both sides hold um, to be able to close non-cooperatively on chain is a different transaction for each person. Um, so they both have two separate transactions with different revocation keys, um, different transaction IDs, etc. 
the whole idea of a generalized lightning channel is that both parties can keep the exact same commitment transaction. And you pretty much do this by changing the channel structure um, to this single commitment transaction that has a single output that goes to a split transaction. And that single output is spendable with both parties cooperatively or the pre-signed transaction they cooperatively sign for splitting or a penalty path for Alice or a penalty path for Bob. And the whole penalty mechanism here is effectively accomplished with adapter signatures made with um, a public key um, that each side holds. <clears throat> and effectively what you do here is to revoke states, you trade your public key instead of the revocation secrets that you do now. And then with that public key, everybody can take an old um, commitment transaction that hits chain and with the signature um, kind of unblinded there, with the public key you exchanged, generate the private key necessary to spend the appropriate penalty path. So you, you're pretty much replacing the whole design of the revocation key with adapter signatures on a single output where only the right party can penalize it because instead of the transaction being different, um, the signature that is unblinded on chain is what leaks the information. And so it's the, the differences in the signatures when you have that public key that was used to make the adapter signatures that exchanges the revocation information. So for this um, watchtower channel design, effectively um, what you're doing is adding a new output to that um, commitment transaction. And from there, you atomically um, tie that to this three of three channel with the watchtower in such a way that, um, here, hold on, let me reorganize my head here. Um, in such a way that this three party um, channel between all three people is loaded by the watchtower with collateral matching the, the channel between the users. And there's effectively a transaction now for the watchtower after a, a long time delay to take that collateral or that bond back. But there is also a, um, a kind of penalty transaction for each participant to take that watchtower's bond if they collaborate with the other user. And this is pretty much done by tweaking the whole setup so that the split transactions um, for old commitment transactions effectively play the same kind of adapter signature games so that if an old um, transaction hits chain and the other party successfully takes it without the watchtower penalizing, then that split transaction confirming on chain gives that other party the information to sign for the auxiliary output in that old commitment transaction, which is used as an input on the transaction to penalize the watchtower. And so all you have to do here is really make sure that the timeout to take the, the bond from the watchtower is longer than the timeout to penalize the um, old state that your party cheated you with. And um, come on, one last thing I'm forgetting. Oh yeah, um, the, the revocation transaction that you or the watchtower could submit um, to, to penalize the other party cheating, that spends the auxiliary output in the, um, the old commitment transaction. So that way, if the watchtower or the user um, successfully penalizes the other party, that invalidates the transaction to penalize the watchtower if they're dishonest um, so that the watchtower can't get screwed here if it acts honestly. And so it, it's really just like this complex scheme here, extending the whole adapter signature trick from generalized lightning channels to link this two of two regular lightning channel with the three of three lightning channel with the watchtower.
so that even though two users are interacting with the same watchtower, if that watchtower does not penalize something that it should, then the user who was cheated can be made whole by penalizing the watchtower. And so the, the whole design space of this is really interesting in the sense that I think they have pulled off um, aligning incentives in a situation where prior to this, I had just gone, that will never happen. But um, the issue here is kind of one, that's a big assumption that a watchtower is going to collateralize every channel they're watching for with as much money in that channel. Um, the entire idea uh, on every other incentive model with watchtowers I've seen has either been purely altruistic, um, paying people just for the amount of data that they're storing, or making atomic guarantees where the watchtower is rewarded, but only if they penalize something um, where the other party tried to cheat you. So that's a big ask. But then also, um, kind of an edge case here is the watchtower does have the ability, if it's acting honestly, to just withdraw um, their money from that three of three channel with you. And if they've been acting honestly, that will eventually become valid and they can just do that. So that would leave those users in a position where they would have to go update on chain to set this up with a new watchtower, or they would have to just go on and kind of go, well, this channel doesn't have a watchtower anymore. So we need to be like, each side needs to be a little more vigilant about staying online. Begging the question. Who watches the watchers? Well, see, that's the, the beauty of it. Aside from the capital requirements and the, the on-chain scalability here, I mean, this is a brilliant <laughs> like tripod arrangement where everybody's watching everybody else. And I mean, you know, like I said, it's I question the viability of this really long term in terms of scalability. But this is really impressive to see like the incentive alignment in this situation lined up properly. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool that you could hold the watchtowers to account for watching. Yep, yep. This, you know, actually, now that I think about it, this might, even if it's not practical for everything, this might be a good way to set up securing very high value channels. You know what I mean? Like the type of stuff think it's idiotic instead of just using things like liquid but <clears throat> you know the design of like high throughput private lightning channels and things like this like this would be a potential way to make it a little more safe to put large amounts in a channel you know what i mean yeah that, that's almost a corollary of being able to legally hold uh, to account uh, your fiduciaries in the regular financial system. Mm hmm. All right. Rant done. Are we ready for a quick little celebration? Yeah, let's get on a different layer. So, Bitcoin Core five days ago merged I2P support. Kaboom. And for people who don't know what that is, it is the Invisible Internet Project. Um, the I2 stands for I squared. And it's pretty much like an onion routed network um, like Tor with the, the one major architectural difference being that by design, it will only facilitate communicating people inside the I2P network. So like any kind of... Um, thing functioning like an exit node where you can route through I2P and connect to the main internet. Um, that is not officially supported by the protocol or project at all. Um, everything running like a service like that on I2P is unofficial, um, unrecommended by the project because the entire design idea um, and difference with Tor was everything should stay inside this network, like poking out to the main internet is like that's a potential security hole for these kinds of systems so th this is this is just awesome in the sense of 
this is a step towards generalizing the network layer Bitcoin uses way more. Like, and it's a real baby step in the grand scheme of where this could go in the sense of different networking mediums. But hey, um, especially given all the the attacks and the reliability issues with Tor lately, um, more onion routing options, very good. Yep. And the sooner you branch out, the sooner you're going to build your code in such a way that you can just slip in a different way to branch if you need to. Um, I2P has definitely been known in the file sharing space, and I've, I've seen that as an option for networks that you can use on torrent software, for instance. Um, have not seen a ton of traffic over that, but the more things that are connected into it, the more traffic it'll ultimately get and the more useful it is. Yep. Yep. This is a uh, yeah, dude. This has just got me excited that we might see momentum start dominoing for things like Antoine Riard's um, Altnet proposal, where he just kind of wants to start breaking the peer-to-peer -peer logic and core into a generalized modular thing where you can just plug new modules in. Mm -hmm. But enough about Bitcoin winning so hard. Um, I think we have some kind of weird big changes that companies want to shove on the internet now? Yeah. First of which is uh, good old Google, who claims they are going to stop selling ads based on an individual's browsing across multiple websites. Akai, your browsing history. This, this is pretty phenomenal in terms of announcements, um, simply because Google accounted for 52% of last year's global digital ad spending out of $292 billion, according to Johns Media, according to Wall Street Journal. About 40% of that money flows from advertisers to publishers on the open internet. Okay, so to translate that, when you go to a web page, the page pops up, and before any ads would load on that page, there's actually a market a bidding market going on behind the scenes where Google says, hey, I've got this captive set of eyes. Here's a bunch of properties around these eyes that are about to get to see your ad if you want. And then anybody in the world who wants to buy your eyeballs can bid for them right there. They do a live bid and then dynamic ads get loaded off of that. And uh, yeah, a large part of Google's revenue flows from this industry. And here they are saying they are no longer going to uniquely identify web users as they move from site to site across the internet. Wait, what? No more cookie? Google, I mean, you're selling well here. This is like the don't be evil playbook, and that's not even your motto anymore. But why does my mind immediately go to what way do they have to track me that doesn't need any of my browsing history. Maybe they just know it's me some other way. So them saying they're not going to use my browsing history to tap, track me may not mean anything because they may just give my unique identifier to a corporate somewhere. And maybe that corporate has access to a giant database that already knows everything about me because they've been tracking me from, oh, I don't know, 1996 till today. So they probably know something. Wait, did, did this article from the Wall Street Journal not go into where they want to go with this post cookies? Sadly, I do not have a sign in. So I got okay. the first couple of paragraphs. Dude, this um, is very interesting. Also, life pro tip, just archive Wall Street Journal. They're fucking paywalls retarded. <laughs> but um, they want your browser locally crunching all the information that cookies let them do on the back end and just creating like identity or topic tags or whatever and sending that off instead we yeah i think this story dropped as a sales of google's not going to track you so much 
but I think it's really very specific to the one thing they're claiming, which is they won't use your specific web browsing history anymore, which probably means they have some other proprietary way that may make them more money directly than using the old method. Let's just say we'll find I'm, out. I'm very worried about what this means for my trust in web browsers plummeting even more. Yeah. If you're going to use Chrome, get the ungoogleified version. There are a number of makers. So, And uh, rolling into that general category of news, uh, we have a new trade organization. I'm excited for this one. It's the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authority, the C2PA. Now, who would be the C2PA, you might ask? Well, this is a trade group that includes Microsoft. Oh my God. And I'm sorry. Yes. I got to cut in with the dude. It, this just clicked into my head. I2P, I squared, C2PA, C, it's the CCP of America, dude. It's the fucking CCP of America. They'll probably figure out a way to slide another C in there. So watch out. <laughs> But uh, this, this little trade group would like to develop specifications for common asset types and formats uh, such that they can put identifiers into your videos, documents, audio, and images that you may want to share around the web. Now, I'm sure those sneaky Chinese or Russians or whoever happens to be the sneakiest won't be able to edit these things. I'm sure this won't be used to falsely attribute a video here, there, or otherwise. And I'm really interested in how they suggest that it won't be strippable out of the format types, how, how I won't be able to take it out and still have a meaningful picture or what have you. So yeah. they don't offer any details yet, but rest assured they are on it, trying to protect you from the deep fakes. I, th this is just like a conflicted subject for me because obviously this is the moron version of morons trying to do things in a moronic way instead of I don't know identity keys, temporal time stamping that Bitcoin can do in an infinitely scalable way. But um, yeah, uh, this is a real problem for the internet in the next few decades. And we are going to need a real solution, but can we get the morons out of the room and start talking about this like adults in ways where, I don't know, it actually solves the problem to the degree it can be solved without being used as another excuse to just totally, utterly destroy more privacy on the internet? Yeah, some of this makes me wonder if this isn't going to be a second DRM revolution. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Adobe's part of this little crew, and we'll see what they come up with. That would not shock me in the slightest bit. All right. We ready for some drama? Oh, boy. Let's wrap it. So I am sure everybody can think back and remember um, all the constant bitching and screaming of... CoinJoin users being flagged at exchanges when Wasabi was reusing the same coordinator address for their fees. I'm sure everybody can remember how everyone got their money back. Um, nothing was taken or confiscated. Um, you know, the, it's just, hey, you went to a KYC business and they're going to ask you questions now. Um, that's how that works. And how everybody kept framing this as, oh, it's only Wasabi. It's just because that address is reused. I mean, just come on, that just that would magically fix it, and then these businesses will never cause problems for coin join. Hey, um, well, apparently Bottle Pay, um, a Twitter-based um, Lightning wallet that actually shut down for a while because of UK regulations getting stricter, and has relaunched again as kind of a an app similar to Strike in terms of blending fiat and Bitcoin interfaces, um, they just rejected a Bitcoin deposit um, because it was involved in Samurai Whirlpool mixing. And again, they didn't take his money. 
They didn't refuse to give it back. They said, we can't accept this deposit and promptly returned his money. So, um, yeah, can we finally be adults now and realize that it doesn't matter what mixing service or, or protocol you're using? doesn't matter what the brand is, what the name is, that when you do that and then interact with KYC services, this can happen. And it's probably going to get more and more common. And it has absolutely nothing to do with which specific thing you're using. It's the fact that you are mixing, period. And I'm going to put a little fucking snide comment in here at the end. Samurai Wallet has a service called Ricochet that just adds hops between transactions before you deposit shit. Um, that was one of the first privacy features they invented almost, I think, four or five years ago at this point. And back then, it was a nice, useful little hack to hack around things. But the idea that this is still a useful protocol or tool or service to try and mix and then interact with KYC services is laughable because they will just twist a knob on their computer and look back more hops and then, oops, you're still getting blacklisted. We're not taking your deposit. And no matter how much funky shit you try to do to peel off change and add hops, that they will notice that becoming a new heuristic and they'll twist the knob again. And it's, it's a game of cat and mouse that you can't win. If you do things like this that regulated businesses feel or actually can't interact with, this will happen. You're not going to win this game of cat and mouse. If this is where this space goes, that's where it's going and nothing is going to stop that. So think about that. Think about that in terms of the actions you take to manage your own coins, to use them, and think about it like an adult instead of like a child that acts like my wallet is safe from this, but that other one isn't because that's a childish attitude and it's dead fucking wrong. Yeah, I've had a few conversations around this topic in the past, and I think a lot of people in Bitcoin would like to virtue signal about how they're post-corporate, post-banking, post-everything else, and then they get a bottle pay account or some other account for some reason and decide to use it against the terms of service on that account and then put up a bunch of question marks about what happened. Um, it's a little bit different when you run a corporation because you're definitely under somebody's legal hammer. And when you're a financial corporation, you sometimes have to announce and show that you're doing due diligence for certain types of crime. Because uh, otherwise the regulators in whatever your locality is just won't let you operate and would literally shut you down. So, I, I'm just reiterating that here. I think most Bitcoiners actually know that, but don't always act like they know that. But that's why that corporation makes the rules, because typically they have a regulator they would like to appease. Or they would just like to be able to look good on paper when somebody does come to them with another problem that's maybe legitimate and says, we'd like to shut you down now. And then they can show, well, we have this internal process by which we vet things. And you know what? This particular bad thing you're presenting to me, it got through our process. We will enhance our process. You don't need to shut us down. There's a lot of give and take like that on the financial side of things. Um, the other thing I would say up this alley is feel free to mix Bitcoin all you want. Like if you want to incentivize the guys building um, these mixing systems, please go go mix your Bitcoins 24 seven and just keep doing it, doing it, doing it. Just like if you want to pay high fees in Bitcoin, please feel free. The miners like the mining machines are expensive. And so is power. So please help them out when you can. Um, for me, I try not to waste my sats on things that aren't necessary. So think about your use case for why you may want mixed coins in the future and why you and when you may not or why you may not. 
Um, I would argue there are different use cases for Bitcoin and you might just do well to think through why you would want some of one type and why you might want some of another type. Yep. This is why my first piece of advice that anybody should hear in this space is ask yourself right now, are you cool with the government knowing that you own Bitcoin if they feel like finding that out? You're cool with that? Go play with KYC shit. You're not? Stay the fuck away from it and stay the fuck away from it from day one because you can't undo it. And don't do stupid shit. Like just mix all your coins and then assume somebody like Coinbase isn't going to go, whoa, 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 when, when these mixed coins start showing up there. Use your head. Like the Bitcoin is not a tribal meme where everybody has to use it the way you do, where everybody has to have the same culture and lifestyle you do. Stop worrying about other people. Think about what you need what you can get out of this tool and use the tool in the appropriate way to accomplish that goal. You're here. All righty. So um, did oh, the man. fallout from solar winds just get a lot worse? This is perhaps the most severe thing that I'm surprised took me several days to hear about this week. Uh, so the headline on this one is at least 30,000 U.S. organizations newly hacked via holes in Microsoft's email software. In this case, we're talking about Exchange Server, a uh, long-running Microsoft product that's integrated all across its stack. Um, in this case, it sounds like there was a set of four zero-day bugs that got exploited simultaneously to allow non-authenticated non-users of the system to start reading people's email boxes. So you don't need a login, you don't need a password, pretty much all you need to know is that the Exchange server's there and you can start dumping emails. Uh, this pretty heinous thing, uh, Microsoft, of course, jumped on patching it. And interestingly enough, it's getting blamed on China, 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 China. Why not everyone, everyone, everyone? <laughs> oh, man. Well, if you had a sharp security team, you know, it, it might have been the day to start poking around a competitor's email network, not fiduciary advice not advice at all so nope. highly illegal stay out of there boys and girls just because you can access it via the wider internet doesn't mean you should yeah but it, it's like the, I, we we're at th this is going to be the fucking decade where everybody just has to viscerally come to terms with the fact that everything is fucking broken and now that everything is running on those broken things they need to be fixed. <laughs> what you refer to as software is actually Swiss cheese. Yep. I mean, like, honestly, dude, I, it's, it really is things like, you know, like Gideon, um, just deterministic build and shit. Like that started off as like super autistic shit that few projects were fucking with like Bitcoin core kind of got ahead of the curve with that. And that's exploding to the point that it's like you have GU or, or GUIX or however the hell it's pronounced. Now you literally have like attempts at package managers and shit rolling in that type of deterministic process of like managing, loading, building things like that whole attitude needs to eat everything. It's definitely time to get our games together. And if you're a corporate still running the Microsoft stack. <sighs> Come on, Red Hat even made it easy. I, I don't know what to tell you. You got to quit paying Microsoft tax, people. Ding, ding, ding. All right. Speaking of not paying taxes. You mean winning? Are you winning, miners? Yeah, so um, a 
House committee in Kentucky has passed in a 19 to 2 vote. Um, that bill, um, I believe we covered on the show a month ago, um, proposing massive sales tax breaks on electricity and a few other aspects of uh, data center operators that would mine cryptocurrency. Uh, so this is actually bucking itself up to the uh, the Senate um, to get looked at and maybe even passed. And I would also like to note that um, a similar bill dealing with data centers in general, so kind of trying to target Google, um, Amazon and such, um, is also kind of in the same point. And yeah, um, let's just say this would be very interesting, um, especially given the uh, particular state it is, if they start pulling in massive amounts of miners with tax incentives, um, data centers in general. And e even the, um, the bill dealing with data centers in general actually looked at other states in the, the Southeast that had done similar things and actually showed even with the initial tax loss hit um, over time, the, the job growth and everything paid back more than the lost tax income. Um, so I, obviously that's not looking at the mining aspect of this, but just data centers in general. But you know, you, you look at tax incentives like this, and um, I look up at things like the budding Starlink constellation, and I start asking myself if the whole landscape of where data centers are set up um, starts changing in the sense of, well, if there's energy there, if there's incentive there, uh, throw up some dishes, let's get going. Yeah, just because of location, my brain jumps to the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was uh, really responsible, I believe, for the initial electrification of the South, more or less, uh, via hydro dams um, back in the 30s and 40s. So I believe there are still a number of those facilities, some of which don't operate in the modern sense. And I wonder about a renaissance as far as restoring and, and getting miners in, uh, in a place where there's, there's plenty of hydropower access if they want to keep it up. And I mean, you know, like the, the same way I kind of talked, um, or have talked a lot about, you know, just mining being an incentive and a way for power companies to bring new generation capacity online in a more profitable way. Um, maybe that same kind of trick could work for data centers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, this will be interesting to see how this shapes up and if other states respond in kind. My prediction is if it passes, they probably will. Bring on that information superhighway. Alrighty, are we ready for the last story and some interesting dynamics? Yes. So the Taiwan or Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, um, the biggest semiconductor manufacturer in the world, has announced that due to the general climate over the last year or so, um, leading to chip shortages. Um, some of it being shortfalls in production last year. Um, another aspect of it being big companies like Google and um, Apple and such scooping up more chips than they usually would just to cushion themselves against future shortages, exacerbating things. Um, well, they've decided they are limiting the access to fab time um, for ASIC manufacturers. Um, so yeah, um, this is going to get really interesting because for most of the time, um, ASICs have been around, um, at the upper edge of the, the nanometer level, um, once they started closely approaching, um, modern chip levels, there was already kind of some competition for fab space. Um, like once you're not playing with like old cheap chips that n no big manufacturer or um, product producer cares about um, you're competing with like nvidia and amd <laughs> for fab time 
So there was already this dynamic in the space of like, you know, there was this throttle where if there was enough demand to surpass it, manufacturers still had trouble meeting that demand because they're competing with these companies. And now TSMC is explicitly like taking that another step further and penalizing ASIC manufacturers against all of these other people competing for fab time. Like not just, well, like make us a better deal. Um, just nope, sorry, we're going to these guys preferentially. And um, yeah, <laughs> this is having and will continue to have as long as this goes on a lot of issues in terms of there's not enough Bitcoin miners being made to meet the demand for people who want to mine Bitcoin. And this is going to get really wonky because generally, um, you know, the hash rate will follow up the price. Um, it's not going to happen in this kind of environment. And the more the price goes up without the increase in production of more efficient ASIC machines, I mean, eventually we're going to see older and older machines um, become profitable and be more valuable as machines in a supply shortage like this. Um, you know, as long as that dynamic goes on where the price is going up and you have ASIC manufacturing throttled like this. So <laughs> yeah, um, that's going to get interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've had kind of a hard time reading into this particular situation around the so-called chip shortages. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the dynamics of it, like how much of it is political, how much of it is manufacturing uh, slash mechanical. Uh, but there are a couple of interesting sentences in this write-up. One of them is, the company is reportedly giving priority to businesses that provide more stable demand, such as smartphone manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another uh, interesting paragraph here. Bitmain reportedly gained control over most of TSMC's available manufacturing capacity for mining chips, forcing other buyers to divide what's left. TSMC's income from mining chips this quarter is still expected to be comparable to what the firm will earn through its partnership with graphics processing units, GPU manufacturers, uh, I'm sorry, manufacturing behemoth NVIDIA. So. They're saying that Bitmain orders chips at NVIDIA's scale, which to me is semi flabbergasting. NVIDIA is not a small company. Um, I wouldn't have accused Bitmain of being a small company, but if Bitmain is ordering chips at NVIDIA's scale, then I would ask, how is that giving priority to businesses that provide a more stable demand? Um, well, it's it, the, it the fluctuations. Like, you know what I mean? You have a lot of demand in manufacturing in a bull market, but that starts petering off on the other side. And also, I, I want to add as a quick note, like a, a decent part of Bitmain doing that was just buying fab space they didn't use. So, Okay, so fab space is a bidding market. The more people who want it, the more expensive it'll be. Whoever pays the most will get access to the fabs. And it's definitely the case that as Bitcoin's price falls, I'm almost certain there's got to be a fall off in those mining chips. So I would call this mm, corporate relations. Uh, if TFMC is telegraphing to the world that, oh, no, 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 no. We're, we're not just falling into the cryptocurrency fad hole here just because they're going to pay us a lot. We will also car manufacturers, Intel, you know, all of Japan, you know, we will still serve your needs too. Um, so I see this as more of a PR move than anything, I guess. No, I really but think this is, there's something here. Cause like, you know, a big part of the thinking I'm assuming on TSMC's part is the fact that you did have Bitmain, like, back in 2017, 2018, bidding and paying for fab time they didn't use just to squeeze out other manufacturers. And so I have to think from TSMC's point of view, watching Bitmain implode on itself, fuck its balance sheet, like all of that, like they're 
like, no, I'm going to go to somebody whose business isn't up, down, up, down. Like there were even periods where, um, like TSMC for a while refused to fab anything for Bitmain until they cleared some of their outstanding debt. So that's a legitimate story that you got to pay the fab before they'll make you more chips. Bingo. If you're a fab though, and somebody's willing to pay you for space and then not utilize it, you should sell it all day. Yeah, but I, I, I really think that it just has to do with the the risk there because it's like ASIC manufacturers, like, yeah, they can clean up, but that's such a risky business. I mean, that's why no market will list them publicly anywhere. It's true that I'm sure, and again, I don't know anything, um, that that's a fluxy business. Uh, however, all that other market is just going to sit there and wait for TSMC to provide it. So that's why I say this is more of a political and uh, telegraphing type story than anything else. I mean, potentially, you're going to have to see how it plays out. But, you know, motive aside, if this actually does continue for a long stretch of time, like this is going to be a really weird bull market in terms of the mining space. Yeah. And I think this highlights that we could use some onshoring of chip fab capabilities, uh, potentially here to the U S uh, it would be great to get it back onto this continent and, uh, just have more of it. Cause it seems like there's a shortage of fab time. Yep. If this is the age of computing, we need more chips. Alrighty, though. I guess we are in final thoughts slash meme time. There are no final memes. Peter McCormick got a node running with a wallet hooked up to it. I'm proud that of happened. you and I'm proud of him. Making history, people. Wow. Wow. Yeah, somebody's going to put that in the books. <laughs> but yeah, I guess on that note, I guess we can call it a day. So uh, hope you enjoyed. Catch you later, punks. Oh, you don't like my final thoughts. I didn't think you had one, sir. Go oh, ahead. I, I only have so many. Well, it was it was kind of a curious week, was it not? Um it seems to me that the theme of this past week might have been negative premium. And uh, I'm saying that because GBTC has traded at a negative premium now for a couple days. And in fact, there's a negative premium on trading your 10-year bonds for cash, which is usually something you have to pay for. So I'm just, I'm wondering what this all means because i don't know i can't tell you guys um i think it's a very interesting question though uh did the markets wake up and realize they could get physical bitcoin last week were they getting squeezed somehow and and wanted to be out of gbtc did they know something we didn't when uh, gbtc traded down before bitcoin itself traded down why does everybody uh want tenure so bad don't know don't know but money is getting weird out there folks so cover your asses yep i still can't even really come up with a rational explanation for that other than just yeah oh we can get bitcoin well part of me wonders if sailor hasn't been really effective at uh his role here in teaching the corporates maybe how they can get around gbdc and the price fluxes thereof. And then there's the whole part of being able to earn income on Bitcoin as an asset, as opposed to pay a 2% per year carrying cost on it through GBTC. Um, yeah, I just wonder if the math isn't changing right in front of us. So uh, keep your eyes on that premium for the longer term answer. Mm -hmm. All right, got anything else for us? That's about all I got. Um, Hats off to everybody who's uh, growing up in our audience, getting a roll upgrade, maybe finding a little uh, risk aversion coming into their lives. Uh, congrats to you. Bitcoin forever. Later, punks. Peace out, guys. <laughs> Bitcoin forever.
Yeah, you need to have fluid to your head. Yeah, you need to have fluid to your head. Yeah, you need to have fluid to your head. Yeah, you need to have fluid to your head. Yeah, you need to have fluid to your head. Yeah, you need to have fluid to your head. Yeah